Bullshit. The No BS Marketing Show is brought to you by Laramore's men's and women's designer clothing, free shipping, free returns. Shop men's and women's designer clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, and more online at laramores.com or in-store downtown Pittsburgh. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich of Mass Solutions. Our guest today is Jane Werner, Executive Director, Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. But first, let's cut the BS. In episode one, I talked about how I was interviewed for a piece in Entrepreneur Magazine tied to decision fatigue, a topic that I've written about, poked fun at a little bit because of the great Snickers campaign of the past number of years about you're not you when you're hungry and the term hangry and all that. That's a lot of that's tied to decision fatigue. And I was being interviewed and the conversation turned to ask me how I battled decision fatigue in my multiple roles. And my initial answer, as I mentioned, in episode one was I don't because I feel I struggle with it just like we all do. But the interviewer left a, a long pause and said, well, you know, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Uh, take a moment, think about what might help others. So in episode one, I talked big picture philosophically about one way about how I only spend significant time on things I'm passionate about, which leads to us being able to achieve some level of mastery at those things. Jane brought in another point about how significant it is to work with a team and delegate that that can reduce decision fatigue. This episode, and we could do multiple episodes on just how to battle decision fatigue. So this episode, I'm just going to break down some specific tactics to avoid decision fatigue that can help you because it's about focusing on managing your information is a major piece of decision fatigue, managing your information intake, because otherwise you quickly lose control of your time. So managing your information intake also means managing interruptions. Interruptions can come in many ways, shapes, and forms. One example is emails popping into your inbox. Here's the thing. Most of us end up subscribing to emails because it seemed like a good thing at the time. Then we forget to unsubscribe. Here's a quick tip that's easily done and will save you time and fight off decision fatigue. Unsubscribe to those newsletters that are clogging your inbox and actually still taking up some of your time to scan, ignore, or open and not read. Go into your search bar, enter unsub, and the search function will scan all of those messages that have unsubscribe options, which means pretty much every email newsletter. Scroll to the bottom where the fine print lingers and follow the link. If you can do this one time for 15, 20 minutes, you will probably knock out a hundred of emails, newsletters you've subscribed to, and you won't even realize you might have a thousand in there. So until you've done this a couple of times and then become disciplined, what ends up happening is you get all these emails and it's in totality that it leads to decision fatigue. You see that number, it's 180, it's 300, it's 500, it's 27, whatever you, if you're an inbox zero person, like I try to be, that can add stress. But even if you're not an inbox zero person, your numbers get up to 1,000, 500, whatever, and most of them are garbage and you know they're garbage, but subconsciously you still stress and obsess over it. So just by going into whatever email package you use, pop in unsub, and then that brings up all those email newsletters. Click on each one, go down to the bottom, click unsubscribe, maybe even set your timer for 10 minutes and think, cause you're thinking, ah, it's not worth it. So only spend 10 minutes and do that once or twice, three times, and you'll have knocked out uh, hundreds of those emails. So that's one quick tactic that I thought I'd use. A second quick tactic is more of an old school media tip. So printed magazines still make an impact, particularly with Gen Xers and Boomers. You just like to have that printed magazine. Subconsciously, though, we notice magazines on our desk and think about how we need to get to those magazines. Well, instead of letting them pile up, here's a quick tip to try. Take two minutes. Yes, two minutes when the magazine arrives, go to the table of contents, scan the table of contents, circle any article that jumps out at you. Go to those articles, rip them out of the magazine, then pitch the magazine, throw it away. Put those valuable articles in your to read file or folder. And if you don't have a to read file or folder, create one. The bottom line is you eliminate potential stress about unread magazines because they're no longer on your desk. And you save your time by focusing only on the articles you know are valuable, and you'll end up finding that you circled three, four, five items, ripped them out. A lot of times they're one page front and back. Sometimes they're just one page on the front. Then while you're ripping them out, you kind of go, this one's garbage, and you scan it. And throw it. Then another one, you go, whoa, this one's gold, and you circle something you want to tell your team or you write somebody's name on it. But it's a quick way because I think 
anyone that's a Gen Xer or a Boomer still probably gets at least two to four publications a month. That's just a quick tip to help you get through it. And then the last idea is to help you manage your information intake and reduce decision fatigue is tied to those dreaded meetings. We all have too many of them, right? So build a formal plan on your approach to meetings. Decide on the front end what types of meetings you call or hold as the meeting leader. Make sure you only call meetings with a clear purpose and when other communication approaches won't work, like a phone call, stopping by to talk to people, emails, whatever. And that's a big problem. People, we, we tend to just schedule meetings as a default. Try to make sure you have parameters. Then make some basic parameters for which those meeting invites you accept and why. And if you communicate that to peers, subordinates, your boss and clients to manage expectations, you'll be fine because it's okay to not attend a meeting if you're able to cover it with another team member and you're upfront about it. Problems occur when you say you're going and miss, or when you come and you're not truly present, you're looking at your phone, barely paying attention, or you come late or leave early. We're all guilty of this, including me. I do that still from time to time. But if you can maintain some discipline and say no to going to the meeting and manage the expectations up front, you are less disruptive to the meeting. So it's making sure that you have a plan around meetings, making sure you have an agenda for every meeting, and then doing pre and post meeting prep. If you do a to-do list, actually write it on your list, pre-meeting prep, post-meeting follow-up. This way you make sure you spend a few minutes on both. It goes a long way towards reducing stress and decision fatigue. Hope this helps and that you're able to avoid being hangry and reduce your decision fatigue. Our guest today is Jane Werner, Executive Director of the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. She leads the team responsible for all aspects of the museum's mission and vision, exhibits, public programming, funding, and operations. In episode one, Jane told us some really great stuff about her illustrious career and how she got to that point. It was so awesome. Her dad told her uh, when she came back and said she was thinking of quitting school or just didn't like the major, her dad said, love what you do. So she did a degree in art education, became an art teacher, realized that managing kids in the classroom wasn't what she wanted. Serendipity, whatever, she ends up on Wall Street working for a Japanese firm where she's the only American there, gets some great experience there, comes back to Pittsburgh, ends up working at three jobs at once, a film editor at WQED, the Buell Science Center, and she sold Samsonite luggage. She mentioned to former Steelers backup quarterback Cliff Stout made a big sell for her when he got traded. And she started to design exhibits for the Science Center. And this just led to her continually getting passionate about this exhibit development and so forth. And one of the key points that I love, because we talk about how marketing is an art and a science, she said there's an art and science connection that artists are similar to scientists because they're always questioning their model of the world. And she also mentioned that kids do this too. So she saw this parallel between artists and scientists. She had a great boss who allowed her to test things and begin to, to grow as a person. Uh, ment mentioned her mentor, Joel Bloom. She went through all kinds of stuff. It was really exciting. So I want to make sure this episode, we get to talk about the Children's Museum because there's tremendous things going on. It's exciting. I was there for uh, an event of, of that's going to be just amazing, but I'm going to let you talk about it. So Jane, welcome back to episode two. Thank you. Was my summary okay? Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, I can't believe, uh, yeah. You were you, wondering. You almost uh, got all of it there. I was except, feverishly, yeah, I was yeah, feverishly yeah. writing notes <laughs> because you gave a lot of good information. I was thinking, she thinks I'm crazy. But I had my head down <laughs> writing notes, all kinds of good stuff. Talk about the mission of the Children's Museum, what someone who hasn't been there needs to know, and then some of the exciting stuff in the future. So this episode's all about that. Okay. Well, you know, I actually got to the science or to the Children's Museum, which we didn't really cover. After my son was born, I had my own company for a while. And then um, when I decided to go back to work when he hit two, because I really am not crazy about two-year-olds, <laughs> I loved him, but... I knew there was somebody who liked him more when he was two. Um, I got this job and I went back to work full time at the Children's Museum. So in 99, we actually uh, became director of the museum. And in 2004, we opened the expanded museum. And that was a real uh, wonderful experience of working with the board and the staff to create this new kind of 
wonderful space. Um, at the time, we had a wonderful board president, um, Ann Lewis, who really went out and, and raised a bunch of money for us. Um, so with the help of the foundations and with uh, the city of Pittsburgh and the state, we were able to raise 20, well, actually it was about $28 million, $29 million. The year before we opened at the Children's Museum, we saw uh, about 86,000 people. We had done a market analysis that said what would be the top number we could um, get at the museum and that we based all of our business plans on. And they said that if you, if we expanded, we would kind of settle in at about 150,000 people a year. So we based all of our business plans on that. We opened in 2004. We did see 150,000 the first year. And then attendance just kept going. Um we now are at about 305,000 people a year in the museum itself. We see about 50,000 people through our outreach program. And we see over, this is the hard one to believe, we see over about a million people a year through our traveling exhibit program. So that all kind of happened. Of the 2004 expansion kind of set us on our way to becoming kind of a, a well-known museum in the museum world, actually, frankly. So you um, get to 350,000. 305,000. 305,000. So when you're at 305 and you're saying that makes you in kind of the... It's mid-range. Uh, mid-range? Yeah, museum. Okay, so what, what would be one that uh, is the top tier and how many would they see? So the Indianapolis Children's Museum um, actually is sees probably 500,000, maybe maybe even more. But they are the both the Children's Museum, Science Museum. I mean, they're everything. Um, and they are also funded with Eli Lilly money. Um, so they have a very large endowment. It's a it's a little bit different model than ours. Um, the Police Touch Museum in Philadelphia is also very large, uh, physically large, um, and they probably see about half a million people, something like that. So you can tell that we're kind of in the mid range uh -huh. there. Um, but you grew three times, two times, two and almost two and a half times what they thought you would get to. Right, and we actually grew even more than that if you actually consider that we were only at eighty. 3,000. It's incredible. So, yeah, so it's incredible what you, growth. What, what led to that? So it's that you had the new... Great management. <laughs> <laughs> no, and a great board, depending on who I'm talking about. <laughs> no, no. Smart. Sorry. Yeah. Smart. Ha -ha. Um, no, it was really, it was the right, right time, right place, right city. It was, our timing was pretty, pretty good. And I think, you know, we're we're getting to be a younger city, um, so demographics are working in our favor. Uh, we have an amazingly generous foundation community here, um, nice old money that stayed, so they're very generous. And I think that we did something a little bit different than most children's museums. We're, we're kind of different than most children's museums. We actually invested in talent rather than stuff. So we hired people to design our exhibits and programs. Um, it's very unusual for children's museums these days to hire their own exhibit department. And we have a, you know, we have a, a 10, 12 person exhibit department now. I think that's right. We also have our own department of learning and research, which is also highly unusual. And so we actually have researchers, learning scientists on staff that look at everything that we prototype to make sure that it works. So we're very much interested in designing experiences that are impactful. And that's a little bit different than uh, most children's museums these days. They, they hire consultants to come in and design exhibits and even to do their learning and research. So, you know, we've we've been very fortunate in kind of growing this museum into kind of a um, a learning institution that's been terrific. Talk about the traveling exhibit. The traveling exhibits is actually something that we started a while ago, but really took off in the last three three years. Um, we have a department of a business development department and design. They're actually combined. And we have seven traveling exhibits out on the road right now. Um, so they range from our Love and Forgiveness exhibit, which is one of my favorite exhibits we've ever designed, um, to Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is the reboot of Mr. Rogers. How People Make Things has been on the road for something like 
12 years. That was the National Science Foundation funded exhibit. We did Eric Carle, um, uh, the Very Hungry Caterpillar author. That exhibit is booked for 10 years. And uh, we opened the Mo Willems exhibit um, on Friday. And Mo Willems is the new Dr. Seuss. He's a very funny, wonderful um, author and illustrator of uh, the books Elephant and Piggy. Um, if you have if you have young children, you know these books, their first readers, as well as um, Nuffle Bunny and Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. Um, so in, the exhibit is called The uh, Pigeon Comes to Pittsburgh, a Mo Willems exhibit, and we're very excited. And that is actually booked for like three years. And what we do is we we take these exhibits that we produce in house that are well researched, that are you know, kind of designed with all the prototyping. And we open them here at the Children's Museum, and then they go on the road. And they're booked for three-month slots um, to other museums and libraries, and sometimes even adult museums. The Love and Forgiveness exhibit has been to the Muhammad Ali Center of the Human Rights Museum in Canada. I mean, it's just been to really interesting places. And we actually make money on it. Um, not only do we make money on that, but we make money on our design services. So we actually have been designing exhibits for Children's Hospital, for uh, the Carnegie Library's children's rooms, for other museums across the country. So investing in all this talent has actually paid off on the other end that we actually have a income stream, an earned income stream that supports the operations of the museum. We're now at about 65% earned, uh, 60, well, we kind of float between 60 and 65% earned income, uh, which is kind of unusual for a museum. So what's the normal percent? It's, it's more like 40, 60, 40% earned, 60% unearned. So we're very fortunate. And, uh, we're very fortunate in being in a fairly strong financial position uh, because we also have been very disciplined about having reserves, building reserves, having operating reserves, having an endowment of $10 million, which we didn't have when I was became executive director. Our endowment was $350,000. So we've been very disciplined about raising money. For that, we actually have a growth capital fund and we have a research and design fund so that we can continue to do interesting work as far as you know, kind of testing ideas. Because we, you know, you can't fail a museum. You shouldn't, you know, you, you, you should, we should be out there testing ideas and kind of really being um, a way for children and parents to learn together. And that's kind of what we're interested in. And the mission, you asked what the mission of, the mission of the Children's Museum is to provide innovative museum experiences that inspire joy, creativity, and curiosity. And we start every st all staff meeting. Actually, the last person in, if you're late, you actually have to say the mission statement. I can't, it's a really great management tool. Everybody gets there on time. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, the, now it's the last person in has to actually uh, say the mission statement. And sometimes it's like a roller derby, you know, people are like <laughs> trying to get in uh, so that they're not the last. That's great. Yeah. So uh, now we're embarking on yet another exciting phase of the Children's Museum. You know, we've, we've been doing block by block development. We actually uh, did the expansion in 2004 where our, our numbers increased dramatically. Then we hopped over and we did uh, the Hazlet Theater, the new Hazlet Theater. That was a project that we did with the uh, Northside Leadership Conference and the Warhol Museum and the Children's Museum. We all went together and raised two and a half million dollars, started a separate 501c3 and launched that theater. And now that's kind of a thriving theater. We then did a big project called the Charm Bracelet Project, which looked at how the arts uh, organizations and cultural institutions on the North Side could band together to really think differently about the North Side. And then finally, we did the park in front of the museum, which opened in 2012, uh, which was kind of a public park that had, I don't know, had gone into disrepair. So we raised six and a half million dollars and we had a national competition for the landscape architect. And it's a great park. It's a wonderful park. It's become um, kind of a, a wonderful place to hang out 
Uh, the people who bought Nova Place told me that the reason, one of the reasons they uh, bought Nova Place is because we stabilized the neighborhood. So we feel like we actually have economic impact in that way. Hey, no BSers, you know I love Laramore's men's and women's designer clothing. It's time for you to take your look to the next level. Laramore's is the place to make it happen for you. How do I know? Because they've helped me for years. You talk about combining professionalism and style. That's what happens when you go with Laramore's. You can shop online at laramores.com or in-store in downtown Pittsburgh. And he looks very nice in his Larimer shirt. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's Jane Werner, Executive Director of Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Jane, you were going through a number of things, and I have like about four questions, I think, so I'm going to try to remember all four of them. I'm going to start with the first one. You said that investing in this talent has paid off with the designers, and you actually are able to make money on the design services with other museums and then places like Children's Hospital. Sometimes that happens through like learning on the process. Other times it was planned. When you were designing this idea of saying we're going to invest in this talent for design services, did you already project that you would sell those services or did it just happen after you started having some success? It happened after we were having some success. I mean, I suspected that we could actually make that an income stream, but I was more interested in having unique and amazing experiences for the visitors coming to the Children's Museum. It was all kind of a happy coincidence that we could then monetize it. Mm -hmm. Then you went through uh, a number of the different things, the block-by-block -block development, the theater, the Charm Bracelet Project. Talk to me about that one, because that's the one I know the least about. Yeah, so the Charm Bracelet Project was actually funded by the NEA. And what we did was we had I think it was four design teams come into Pittsburgh and look at all of the cultural institutions that were on the north side and look at the linkages. So they, you know, the cultural institutions were the charms. And we were looking for the linkages between the institutions programmatically through a marketing, uh, through marketing and through urban design. So it was it was fascinating to have outside people come in and look with fresh eyes on all of the wonders of the North Side and how to, to link all those things together. I mean, they came up with great ideas. And one of the ideas was to redo the park because it was the center of kind of the historic Allegheny City. Another idea was to actually do programmatic things. I mean, not only just having like a penguin come over from the aviary to the Children's Museum, but how could we actually work together to link each other? So, you know, we actually came up with this idea of having joint memberships. So there were really interesting ideas that kind of bubbled up from it. Um, and we continue to work pretty closely together. Oddly, when we started the project, we didn't even know each other really very well, the, the cultural institutions. Now we know each other and we can call each other up and, you know, kind of work together. Um, it has actually kind of morphed into something that the Buell Foundation is now funding, where each one of the institutions takes a grade in the Pittsburgh public schools on the north side. So we have first graders. So every first grader on the north side comes to the museum twice. We go to their school three times and then there's a family night at the museum where, in our case, we give them all free memberships to the museum if they show up on uh, family night um, so that they can come back again and again and again. So the charm bracelet lives, lives on in kind of a strange sort of way. It is, it is uh, an interesting area that there's so much going on on the north side that I think a lot of people – aren't aware of unless you're right in that demo that um, maybe is going there. And I admit my own ignorance until years ago, I, I started going there for basketball at that youth places where my sons were playing in these leagues. But then uh, I met Mike Duckworth and he's involved on your board. He's our so, president of the yeah, board. President yeah. of the board. Great guy. Shout out to Mike. So that leads me to the next question. So the uh, cool event that I came to mm -hmm. recently, talk about that because I just was amazed at the, what you found when you were tearing things up down and so forth and what the vision is for that. Sure. So the next phase in our development is to take on the old Carnegie Library. Um, it was the first Carnegie Library ever commissioned by Andrew Carnegie, um, and it was in Allegheny City, the part of Pittsburgh that was Allegheny City. And um, it was actually um, closed, I think it was 2000 and 
want to say it's like 2009, 2007, something like that, um, when the library was built up on Federal Street. We talked about how our attendance has just increased tremendously. And we were looking to kind of expand and think differently. So we have a number of partners that rent space at the Children's Museum who work uh, with or on behalf of children. So Allies for Children, which is a child advocacy group, is with us. Reading is Fundamental, Saturday Light Brigade, uh, which is a radio show for kids. Um, they do more than that, but they're with us. And who am I missing? Oh, we have two Head Start programs of the Pittsburgh, two early childhood programs of the Pittsburgh Public Schools on site. So we have all these partners and, you know, we have all this attendance and it's just crazy. Um, and here's this library building that was closed right next to us, this beautiful building. So we decided to do something called Museum Lab. And the notion is, can we take all of the things we're learning that our learning scientists are finding out about how kids learn, and can we translate it into the formal classroom? Can we actually help change how people think about education? So in the Carnegie Library, our partners, Reading is Fundamental and Saturday Light Brigade and Allies for Children, along with a new partner, the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, they're actually going to be moving into the ground floor of the Carnegie Library, this old Carnegie Library Museum Lab. It's now its a new name. On the first floor, we're actually putting activities and yeah, activities for older kids. We're talking about the middle-aged child, the 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old. And then on the th uh, second floor, we are putting Manchester Academic Charter School. And so this is a, a school that already exists and with neighborhood kids. And what we're looking at they're going to a project-based learning. And so we're going to be taking what we know works in the museum and seeing how it works with these older kids. We're going to start off with a maker space. The maker movement has been around um, where it's the intersection of the physical and the digital and how they kind of act together. Um, so it's a little bit of shop class along with a little bit of computer programming and with art thrown in. So we're going to be actually taking everything we've known to know about the maker movement and translating it for older kids. Very exciting. Museum Lab is going to be the next iteration um, of who the museum is becoming, um, kind of reaching up to older kids, as well as having, uh, we're going to open up more space because we're moving our partners into the library, and we're going to open up more space for younger kids at the current facility. So Museum Lab will be its own separate identity separate from the Children's Museum, because we're going to be working with older kids, and we're going to be doing interesting, wonderful, exciting work in there. Great concept. So yeah. one little quick story to tell is the interesting one that uh, made some headlines when the workers were cleaning things up and taking things down and getting it ready for the reconstruction. Tell that story of what they found. Sure. So um, the construction workers, it was a building that was built in the 1890s. And in the 1970s, it was renovated with a lot of drywall. Uh, and so things were covered up. And when we were taking the drywall back down, we actually found five paintings um, that were kind of in these nooks in the grand room of the library. And they were of five authors. So it was kind of interesting. We know who three of the people were. Emerson, Parkman, and a poet by the name of Wiley. And then we have these two guys that we don't know who they are. <sighs> uh, so, um, yeah, we actually uh, have stabilized the paintings and taken them off site. And they're in storage right now. And we're trying to decide what to do next. But it's kind of fun and exciting to find them. Just a really interesting story. And I, I got the tour of the place where the way it looks now and the, the vision you have for when it will be done. What is your time frame for all that work to be done? It's under construction right now. That's crazy. It's under construction right now. This uh, school will open in January of next year. Um, they're actually going to make a mid-year uh, move. And we are uh, we're planning on opening in the spring of 2019. Fantastic stuff. That's Jane Werner, Executive Director of Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Jane, give our audience a tool that you use to help you become more productive 
or to help you communicate better. So I'll give some examples. Uh, one guest talked about uh, used SEMrush to look at websites of competitors and look at his website. A content creator talked about how they use Google Trends uh, to scan what they can go for inspiration to write something. Other people talked about project management tools they work on with their team that are cloud-based and everybody can communicate easily. It can be any type of tool. One person said Evernote. Any type of tool that you think uh, helps you become more productive or helps you communicate better that you think would help our audience. Um, whenever I talk to new executive directors, they always ask me, you know, what would be the one piece of advice that I can give them? Actually, I always give them to every Friday or Monday, sit down and do a weekly update to your board that five points, no more than five, five sentences that say what happened during the week. And then I also send that out to the all staff. I change it around and, you know, what what's important to the staff is different than what's important to the board. It is the best management tool I can give you. I don't know why. Everyone loves it. Um, it's from my perspective, which is really quite good. And, you know, it's good for me because at the end of the week, you're always like, what have I accomplished? This actually gives you a moment to reflect. And I don't think we do enough reflection about the decisions we make or what has really happened during the week. Um, the other piece of advice I give people, every August, I sit down and I talk to every one of our board members. I have a coffee or lunch or drinks, and I just say, what do you think? How do you, how do you think things are going? And I can't say enough about how wonderful those experiences are. And frankly, the weekly update came from one of those coffees. It was not my idea. It was actually from a board member. Two great uh, ideas, two great tools. Jane, you've been a great guest. Was there anything you thought that I would ask you that I didn't? Hmm. Is there anything that you didn't get to go over that you'd like to? Sure. We are still raising money for our museum lab. <laughs> we, it's an $18 million project. We have raised 14 and uh, we're working on the last 4 million. So if anyone is interested in having a tour of the space and coming over and helping us, you know, it's all for kids. Um, what we do is really to, you know, make the world a better place um, and to really think uh, deeply about how we can do that. What's the best way for someone to reach out to talk about trying to meet you and tour the place and donate? Well, you can actually just go to our website, www.pittsburghkids.org, and all the information is there. Or you can give us a call at 412-322-5058 and ask for Jane. I'm the only Jane there. So You're a great guest. appreciate you being here. Thank you. And to our audience, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show brought to you by Larimore's Men's and Women's Designer Clothing. Free shipping, free returns. Shop men's and women's designer clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, and more online at Larimore's.com or in-store downtown Pittsburgh. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Are you signed up for the No BS Marketing Weekly Update? Jane's Tool is a weekly update. We want to make sure you sign up for our weekly update. You'll receive timely, valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. Again, to sign up, visit MassSolution.biz. If you email me at Dave at MassSolutions.biz and tell me your favorite hangry story or when a friend, family member, or coworker was battling decision fatigue, I'll send you a free hardcover copy of Get Where You Want to Go Through Marketing, Selling, and Storytelling, my first book. Not the paperback or Kindle version, a signed hardcover of the book. Send your email to dave at MassSolutions.biz with your thoughts on decision fatigue and the signed hardcover of Get Where You Want to Go Through Marketing, Selling, and Storytelling is yours. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions, no BS. Thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show, brought to you by Larimore's Men's and Women's Designer Clothing. Free shipping, free returns. Shop men's and women's designer clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, and more online at larimores.com or in-store downtown Pittsburgh. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes, plus additional marketing and messaging resources like our No BS Marketing Weekly Update. Sign up and receive timely, valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. Again, visit MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.